Welcome to the Neon Noise Podcast, your home for learning ways to attract more traffic to your website, generate more leads, convert more leads into customers, and build stronger relationships with your customers. And now, your hosts, Justin Johnson and Ken Franzen. Hey, 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 Neon Noise Nation. Welcome to the Neon Noise Podcast, where we decode marketing and sales topics to help grow your business. I am Justin, and with me, I have my co-host, Ken. Ken, how is Ohio treating you today? Ohio is, I think today is the last nice day in the foreseeable forecast. Uh, We've got uh, some 70s going on, which is great, but it uh, looks like it's going to be 50s, of the highs of 50s uh, coming up in the future. I think you're due for a trip back to your home state of Ohio here in a couple of weeks, so you yes. might want to pack the uh, snow boots in the parka there if you still own one and bring that with you. Definitely going to need to do that. It's probably going to be rather, rather chilly and not Florida weather when I get up there. So, anywho, enough about that. The show today uh, is exciting. I think it's going to benefit many of our listeners. One of the biggest problems companies face is hiring and finding new talent. And our guest today is an expert when it comes to the recruiting arena. Today, we will be speaking with Jennifer Newbill. She's the Director of Global Talent Acquisition Center of Excellence, leading Dell's candidate attraction, engagement, and experience. Jennifer and her team manage the global employment brand strategy and are also closely partnered with various Dell teams on employee advocacy and measuring employee and market sentiment. Jennifer has been with Dell Inc. for over 14 years in various human resource roles, including recruiting, leadership and development, and HR operations project management, Jennifer, welcome to Neon Noise. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Please fill in the blanks on anything I may have missed and share with us a little bit of detail about your background. Absolutely. Um, so you did a great job, which of course was was what I wrote in my bio. So I was listening to it going, I think this sounds familiar. And I'm like, oh, I think I wrote that. Um, I've been in, in HR um, really heavy hand with, in recruiting for about 20 years. And um, the, the, the how I got into recruiting is, is always sort of interesting. And I think for the most part, anybody that's in recruiting, you don't get a degree in recruiting. People don't go to college and say, you know what, I want to be an expert in recruiting and that's what I'm going to study in school. And so usually people have kind of an interesting background in how they got into recruiting. For me, it was I, I, I went to a liberal arts school. I studied psychology. So I have a little bit of kind of that that psychology bent, and that's where things like advocacy and trust and sentiment really excite me in my role now. Um, and then I decided to get a master's degree in business because I thought, I've got a liberal arts degree in psychology. What am I going to do? So I moved to <laughs> Dallas. I went to school just north of Dallas and studied business and got a really good kind of foundation. Um, and then I learned about an organization called Hydric and Struggles, and they are an established, very well-respected executive search firm. So that's actually where I started, which is maybe a, a, a little bit of a, of a strange um, path because usually people will go there later in their career. Um, and what we did is we worked with large corporations in finding very senior level talent. So I worked in research and this was before, um, I love to date myself, but this was really before the internet was used a lot at work and email was a very new thing. And so we had a library of actual books. So Hoover's, Who's Who in Business in America, that was what I used to help identify talent. And then I, I did a lot of cold calling. So that's early part of my career and how I got into re into recruiting. We're getting more and more questions about how to acquire talent. It seems like right now in the economic situation that we're in, a lot of clients turn to us and say, Justin, Ken, we're really busy right now. In fact, we're, we can't sustain the amount of demand right now that's being asked and we need to increase our workforce. What type of guidance can you give us to attract new talent, young talent, the right talent, the superstar, all-star and I just look at him and say, I'm not in recruitment. I, 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 I get that. Yeah. It seems like I'd be a good fit for this and uh, someone that could answer your question. But it's still marketing, right? Recruitment marketing or employee, employer branding and in attracting talent 
the right people because your company is as good as your people are. So can you kind of break down to us a little bit, dive into that, uh, what maybe recruitment marketing or employer branding is and, and why it matters and, and maybe are some high level approaches to it? I think one of the observations I've made is smaller companies tend to think we need marketing and we're marketing our products and services. And they tend to wait to really hire someone or think about recruitment marketing. And that's where I think it's it's a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, I was going to say mistake and I thought, no, I don't want to be negative here. But I think it's very common where if you're a startup or a smaller company, having a holistic approach to the market that includes not just attracting potential people to purchase your products and services, but also potential people to work for your organization is probably one kind of high level piece of advice I would give. Now and then it starts to get into the minutia of of how do you do that, right? Um, There's a lot of different ways you can do it. And I think it depends on your growth strategy, where are you located, how many offices. We're a startup, but we have five locations. We're a startup, we all work remotely, right? We're a startup, we have one location. We are all in Austin, Texas, right? So I think that's where some of the caveats start to come in. But that's where digital can really help quite a bit. So if you have, if you're a startup company, you have your page on LinkedIn, it is never too early to start thinking about how LinkedIn can help you build pipelines and connect with candidates. And and that's just sort of one example. I'm not saying you have to, to, to use LinkedIn, but typically smaller companies are engaging on LinkedIn, creating profiles, thinking about how they can leverage LinkedIn from a social selling standpoint. But they think, oh, we're only 50 people. We don't need like a recruitment marketing strategy. Really, it's never too early to have a recruitment marketing strategy. And so looking at Facebook and how you connect with people holistically, looking at LinkedIn, looking at Twitter, whatever properties you're choosing to look at. And it's never too early to start asking your employees for feedback, understanding how they're feeling, what the sentiment is, and seeing, do we have reviews on Glassdoor? I was looking at a company that's a bit of a competitor for our organization today, but they're much, much smaller. But they're nimble and fierce and dynamic and super cool. They only have 11 reviews on Glassdoor, right? That's not a lot. I thought, oh, that's that's not a lot of reviews. But I'm curious, has anybody at the company even read them? Are they talking to their employees about Glassdoor? Are they talking to their employees about how they're feeling? Do they know what people are saying? So I, I think for smaller companies, it's kind of never too early to start thinking holistically about marketing the company to include, oh, we're also trying to attract talent. The second answer I would give um, is, you know, you can't rely on email um, for, for so long. And in recruitment marketing and recruiting, we also have CRMs. So instead of customer, they're candidate relationship databases. And there's some candidate relationship databases that are really nimble, really fierce. They're great for small companies. It is never too early to build pipelines of talent and stay connected with people. You may only have two positions open now. All of a sudden, you're going to get hit with 12. If you're a 50-person company, that's crazy. I've been with startup companies before. I know what that's like to go from we have one rec to we have 15. Oh, my God, how are we going to hire 15 people? So, again, being proactive and having some kind of relationship database that helps you manage the pipeline of people that you meet at conferences or events or you know, you listen to on a podcast or you connected with and follow on Twitter is never too early because what happens is you get behind the curve and then all of a sudden you get some funding, right? You get a big deal. You have to hire 15 people. And again, 15 people for a 50 person company is like a nightmarish kind of scenario. And again, I've been there. So I would just say it's never too early to start thinking like a recruiter when it comes to talent. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think about that, the uh, growing, you know, you want to grow quickly, you want to scale quickly, but you also want to do so in a, in a manageable way. Mm-hmm. And so having the right tools and a plan in place is, is essential there. Now, what about uh, making your company an attractive place to, to work? If, if we're all recruiting for the, let's say we're all recruiting for the top one percent of the talent pool i know that's not the target for every business out there some businesses are recruiting for those that are fresh out of college other businesses are looking for those that are the veterans that are experienced and need no training but let's say that we're chasing after the same talent pool whether they're at the top or the bottom of that spectrum 
What are some of the things, I mean, Dell looks like uh, some of the pictures I've seen, I've never been to any of your facilities, but they look like they got some pretty nice facilities and looks like a pretty cool place to work. Mm-hmm. And you see some of these startups with uh, ping pong tables and <laughs> bean bag chairs and they feed you breakfast, lunch, and dinner and you can take food home with you. And yeah. All things that we don't have here at Neon Goldfish. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I what- think um, re- when I moved into employment branding, it was still relatively new. This was about seven, eight years ago. And I'm very self-taught and I read everything I absolutely can about attracting people to an organization. One of the things we found, especially for millennial Gen Zers, is they're like ping pong tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I want is to be challenged and to have wonderful experiences, especially if that includes some travel or international travel. Not every company can offer that. Right. So we're throwing that out there. Sure. But I want to have I want to take advantage of this time in my life where maybe I don't have a family or maybe I'm really trying to figure myself out. And I want a company that invests in me in that way. So ping pong tables aside, that's really what a lot of the people that are newer to the job market are telling us. So what do we do with that information? Well, we showcase people that work for us that have those stories to tell. So my big platform is always about leveraging your employees to be advocates and to share their experiences through storytelling. And we know that individuals are trusted more in the marketplace now than institutions are. So we know from research from people, organizations like the Edelman Trust um, Survey that's been happening for 17 years now, they're like, hey guys, for the last five to six years, trust in institutions has gone steadily down and trust in individuals has gone up. So it's this interesting sort of flip-flop that's happened. So if you're relying on a corporate account or a corporate message to attract people, especially if you're a smaller company, you're sort of kidding yourself. So even if you only have five people on staff, every week talk about one of those people with a picture of them, with a quote, something inspirational, something about them also personal, not just professional. If you have a connected or flexible workforce, which we do, I am talking to you from my guest bedroom in Austin, Texas, not from our corporate headquarters. Um, That's an amazing program we have at Dell. A lot of people want flexibility. Show people working at home, you know, with a picture of their dog or their cat on their shoulder or whatever, whatever that is, that's very effective. And it kind of demonstrates your culture But in general, if you can't meet the needs of what people want, they will figure it out, which is a little scary in recruiting. Because again, go back to kind of mid to late 90s when I started, it was newspaper adverts. It was complete lack of information that the candidates had. There there was no way for them to find out except to hopefully somebody will call me and I will interview and it will be this awkward day of interviews and I will try to ask questions. But really, it's not about the candidate. It's about the company because that's the way it was back then. And I may say yes to a job. And then it turns out it wasn't the right fit for me or it wasn't the right fit for the company. So I think transparency is a good thing because our candidates are more informed, but it's also so much more competitive. So be competitive. Think about a marketer like you do with your products and services, just like you do with talent. And think about what does the talent want to know? Well, they want to know, is this exciting work? Are these cool people? What's the kind of the philosophy of the company? If you recall, um, the Reed Hastings, who's the founder of Netflix, wrote this manifesto. And this was years ago, and he titled it Culture Code. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but a lot of companies have followed suit, and we have our own culture code at Dell. And what he did is he said, you know what? I want to think about talent, and I want to share my philosophy about what it's like to work at Netflix. And, and it, it seems a little ivory tower, but honestly, it was him being very transparent about what people could expect if they work with Netflix, so as a partner or, you know, a vendor, and if they worked at Netflix. And I think it's behooved them in such a tremendous way. So being very transparent, leveraging your employees, their stories, asking them to speak on your behalf, um, which is very scary at first, but we do a lot of that at Dell. And all it's done is improved our employee sentiment and improved improve the external sentiment on sites like Glassdoor. So that would be my, my big chunk of advice and you could spend years doing that and focusing on that's not a six month kind of thing and that's why some companies hire people like me because they're like whoa we need like a person and a whole team to help us do this on an ongoing basis like this is a lot of work 
my team and I are a marketing, an end-to-end -end marketing team that sits within HR. So what is your platform? I mean, are you putting these out, uh, these stories? Are they video stories? Are they text-based yeah. stories? Um, what, and how are you getting the distribution on these? Where are we you pushing all these out through? Stories. So anything from a visual graphic that can sort of tell a story in a graphical way, depending on the topic, to a, a picture. A static picture works very, very well on social media. Not everything has to be video. There's a lot of video. It's going to be 85% of content on Facebook. Maybe that's what Facebook thinks or Facebook wants, but people don't always want to watch a video or they are not always in a position to listen or listen to audio on a video. So if you do video, think about the, the, the candidate experience, think about closed captioning so that people can listen to it with the sound off, things like that. But we are really, really excited about Instagram. It's not new. Instagram has been around for a while. But we sort of sat back and watched it because we've seen things like Periscope and Meerkat and other platforms sort of get really ex people excited and then they go away, right? And so we tend, we're not risk averse, but we tend to say there's only so many properties where we can play. And when we make a commitment, boy, we make a commitment. And so Instagram is great because that's where our employees really create the majority of our content. So not only is it easy for us, um, so my team doesn't have to create a lot of content for it, um, our employees feel like they have a voice. So what we do is we encourage our employees, if you're sharing content on Instagram that has to do with the day in the life of your job, with your coworkers, going to happy hour, community service, whatever it may be, right, um, share that and tag us. And then we sort of scan all of the careers at Dell, life at Dell tags, and we pick some that we like and we repost them on our um, on our feed. Some companies are very nervous about doing this, and some companies are in industries that are highly regulated. They just can't do that, and I get that. At Dell, being in technology, it's sort of like the world is our oyster, um, and we can do that. So I, I would caution people to kind of think through what that process is like and what you can do based on your industry. But our Instagram feed is just full of our employees sharing what they're doing and their experience from their perspective. It's not really a corporate, here's our message, you know, here's stock photography, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're shying away from stock photography more and more and more. And we will start to have on all of our properties, the majority of our imagery be our employees and just get away. Because people know what stock photography is. And again, it feels corporate. And when it see, when somebody sees corporate, they think not only kind of not dynamic and kind of stale, but they think, boring or they think well i don't know if i can trust this message trust is is the word um hashtag trust i want to put it on a t-shirt um but we're, we're we love instagram we are on linkedin because really linkedin is still a huge property and we do get some benefits we run media on linkedin this is what bigger companies do although smaller companies can start to think about media in smaller chunks but we run media and we drive people to what we call lead capture pages and we'll have some some copy and some information about we're looking for salespeople. Are you interested? They don't have to fill out an application. They don't have to fill out a form. They just click the button and go, yep, I want to hear more. That triggers the recruiting team to scan their profile on LinkedIn and then call them. So there's some really beautiful things you can do on LinkedIn that are very low-hanging fruit for the candidate. And it's all about their experience now. Twitter is just a feed of our culture that whoever engages on Twitter can see if they want to engage with us and follow. And it, it, and it serves a, a purpose. Um, I don't think we get a lot of hires out of Twitter. So again, it's more the top of the funnel, kind of the brand awareness piece. And then Facebook is kind of the big challenge right now. Facebook is doing really cool things with like Facebook Live. Everybody's still on Facebook. Facebook groups are exploding. There's things you can do on Facebook that are, that are exciting, but organic content on Facebook without any targeting doesn't seem to be performing for us like it used to. And I hear that from a lot of people in jobs like mine with other large corporations, not just technology companies, but, you know, consumer goods and things like that. So at some point in the story, you have to start thinking about paid versus organic and budget, but knowing who your targets are and having that constant dialogue around who those targets are and using your money really judiciously is very important. And at some point, in the growth story of a company, it has to become part of the dialogue, especially with Facebook. Posting and praying on Facebook does not work anymore. You described your team as a, as a marketing team within HR. Mm -hmm. 
but you're you're in the HR department. You you aren't part of the yes. marketing department. Correct. We okay. um, roll up to our chief HR officer. Yep. Perfect. So, how closely do you work with marketing department and the social properties that you're working with? Are they HR social properties or are they company corporate properties that you share with marketing? Yeah, that's a great question. We have our own properties, excluding LinkedIn. So we have a Dell LinkedIn page, a Dell EMC LinkedIn page. We just went through a big merger about a year ago, um, an RSA LinkedIn page. So all of our brands, our big brands, have presence on LinkedIn. And we contribute content to some but not all of those pages, right? So if we're hiring cell storage people in Dell EMC, we will send content about we're attracting salespeople for Dell EMC specifically at storage salespeople. And they'll share our content on their feed. But there isn't necessarily a careers LinkedIn property, if that makes sense. So that's a shared property and it works. We have no problems with it. It works great. I will tell you about four to five years ago when we were starting to share our content, hey, we'd like to see more culture and people stuff in LinkedIn and maybe some job stuff too. Cause you know what? People use LinkedIn for jobs on occasion. <laughs> and we were told initially, and I quote, our followers aren't interested in this content. And that was a little disheartening. I think other people have heard that same thing before. My approach was to say, okay, let's talk about our objectives. What objectives do we have as an organization, right? Kind of the big objectives. So, you know, Obviously, we want to sell our products and services. How do we do that? That's through having great talent. And when you sort of have that discussion and you say, this is cool, we have the same objectives. People kind of can't deny that or fight <laughs> fight it anymore. They go, you know what? You're right. We do have the same objectives. And then you say, hey, tell you what, you're concerned that the followers aren't going to engage with our content. Let's have a pilot. We'll give you one piece of content that we feel really good about a week, right? And we'll do it for four weeks. And then after the four weeks, we'll say, how did that content perform? What was the engagement like? Right? Were people liking? Were people sharing? Were people commenting? And so we, that's a good way to kind of get your foot in the door with the owners, the marketing team, if you're HR and the owners of the properties um, for a shared platform like LinkedIn. For Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we have our own life at Dell or careers at Dell instances. And our marketing team is aware and they're fine with it and they have no problem with it. Um, but it's where you have these shared properties like LinkedIn. I think the conversation gets really tricky and difficult. And I think, you know, I love the word pilot. There's nothing better than a pilot because it, it creates trying something, evaluating it, seeing what the results are and either throwing it out or saying, Hmm, this is interesting. We all see the numbers here. Let's revisit the conversation. And that worked really well for us on LinkedIn because what happened is, and it's happened pretty consistently since that time, this was several years ago, so we're all playing very well together in the same sandbox, was, wow, last quarter out of our top 20 pieces of content on LinkedIn, 10 of them were related to culture and careers. And we, and we don't say, I told you so, because that's rude. But <laughs> <laughs> we think it inside of our heads. We're like, yep, okay, great. And they're like, we love your content. We're like, we don't remind them that they said, what they said. We don't, cause that's rude. We just go, that's great. And we have the same goals and objectives. Isn't this awesome? We're all part of the same team cause we all work for Dell or Dell incorporated. Right. Um, so this is great. This works really well together. So we kind of got over some initial little bumps. Um, and, and thankfully we're, we're actually, I hear people complain, um, about the bumps they're dealing with, with cross functional, um, and cross team collaboration and it's a real thing and it's a real challenge and I feel bad because I say we don't have those anymore but we've had them in the past and I validate them and I know they're absolutely valid and I think what happens is behaviorally people see somebody going into their space and they land grab and they get territorial because they get really nervous and that's just a normal psychological response to it's almost like being in your home and somebody getting on your front porch and knocking your door and ringing your doorbell. You're like, who is this? What are you here? What do you want with me? This is my property. I didn't expect anybody. It freaks people out. It's a very normal reaction. So coming to the table with some really good collaborative discussion around you do you and boy, you are good at it. And we did a lot of that with our marketing team, stroking lots of egos 
goes very, very far. You have to do it from a place of authenticity, though, right? Um, you have to mean what you say because people will, will see through that. But saying you do great work, we want to figure out how we can leverage you and your expertise in this world and, and, and also have more consistency from a visual identity and messaging standpoint. Can we do that? And they go, oh, yeah, we can. That's, that's really cool. <laughs> so we have all of our creative in-house. We do not work with a third party. We work with our Dell brand creative team on our visual identity and our messaging. It ties to the bigger Dell picture, so it doesn't look like we're a different company. But we have some of our own rules and our own guidelines. Do we use our own font? No. We have to use the Dell font. Do we use our own color palette? No. Pepto-Bismol Pink is not part of our color palette. We are not allowed to use it. Um, but do we feature stories and people and slightly different messaging based on the conversation we're having with our followers? Yes. So it's worked really well, but it takes time. You've got to take your ego and kind of put it aside and go, put yourself in their shoes. You're an HR person getting in their marketing space. It's uncomfortable for them. And I think going to a meeting and saying, this is what we need and what we want from you is a bad idea. It just won't work. It'll, it'll really blow up in your face. I, I like the ways in which you're playing well together, but also respecting each other's roles. That's, I think that's important from a corporate aspect. And, you know, for small businesses, I mean, a lot of these things don't exist. We don't have uh, marketing and HR departments uh, with the, uh, maybe a, a smaller company, even like me on Goldfish, we, yeah. we, you know, we're, we're six people and uh, we do fun things, but we definitely don't have, uh, you're talking, I think, to the marketing and HR department. <laughs> yeah. right now. That's awesome. So that's, well, that's yeah. great. It's all and yeah. So we're, we're, we're in an alignment with ourselves um, pretty well, but um, some of these things that you talk about that uh, is so exciting, what are some of the, some of the successes, some of the things that you've learned over the years, some of the takeaways that we could help one of our listening audiences, an entrepreneur, a small business owner that is probably m maybe a little bit bigger than a neon goldfish, but maybe not quite a yeah. Dell Inc., who is looking to say, all right, I, I like this idea of, of recruitment marketing. I love everything that Jennifer's saying here, but how can I apply this on a smaller scale or a different yeah, scale? For absolutely. Me? I think that's a great question. I mean, again, I would go back to never underestimate the power of your employee's voice in the marketplace, no matter how big or how small you are. And it's never too early to start including your employee's voices in anything that you do and anything you talk about and encouraging that. Now, encouraging that scary. So start thinking about, do you have a training program um, for your employees? Do you have do's and don'ts, right? For a really small company, it, it, it's probably a little more simple than for rolling out um, training to thousands of people in different locations around the globe. I would also say um, really try to be as keenly aware and mindful of your return on investment, where you're spending your money and what results you're expecting from that and what results you're getting. And I say that sort of as two separate things because I have to remind certain people that some of our plays and some of the actions, the activity we take are about awareness and about the top of the funnel. And you'll get things like, well, everybody knows who Dell is. First of all, actually not, not everybody does. So let's just take that line of thinking and throw it away. But secondly, a lot of people have misperceptions of Dell. So sometimes awareness or our adjusting perceptions of a company educating people like GE. GE is not really an appliance company anymore, right? And I have a friend that runs, you know, employment brand at GE. She's amazing. And we've had many discussions around, gosh, you know, GE does cool stuff. And I don't know if you saw their their ads that they had with the with the parents and the son that was going to work for GE and the and the parents had this crazy misperception about what do you mean you're gonna be an engineer at GE? GE doesn't do engineering. And so there's some really cool examples of big companies that it's never too early to start thinking about and think, okay, from this property, we're not going to spend money and we're just trying to get awareness or we're going to spend money and this is the return on investment that we want because we want people to click into jobs and we want to get hires from it. So I think kind of having that distinction and being really clear about that and having that conversation all the way up to the senior level is really, really important. We create some content that we don't necessarily expect people to then go and click jobs on. Will they? Yes, they may do that. And that's it. That's a bonus for us. Then we create some content where we're saying we want people, the call to action is to click on jobs and we want to see how this video or how this particular piece of content performed. 
So I think it's never too early to start measuring, really getting some clarity around what type of results you're looking for and what sources are working well for you. So I think that's another one. So employee advocates and measurement would be the two really um, big pieces of advice that I would get. I would also throw out this idea of collaboration. So you guys collaborate great because there's there's six of you, but at some point, um, let's say ne Neon Goldfish becomes, you know, 250 people and you're dispersed around the US. There's an inflection point. I've heard 50 people, 75 people. There's a point where everybody starts to kind of get siloed. Being mindful of that and keeping those, what are our objectives collectively, conversations happening, you might be able to avoid some of that from occurring. And I think that that would be a beautiful thing. Um, I know an, an HR leader that runs a, a start, an HR organization for a startup company that's kind of exploding. And one of my really good friends is one of the executives over there. And she's done an amazing job doing that where they've gone from like 75 people to now they're like almost 500. And she's just one of those people that's always thinking about the future and what are the potential roadblocks and keeping those lines of communication open so it doesn't turn into, well, recruiting's your job recruiting. It's not mine. That's a very common thing that we hear. Recruiting and talent attraction is everybody's job at the company. And if you kind of start that discussion early and keep it going and have the CEO and all of his or her direct reports saying it constantly, it's going to become a part of the culture. And when things like that become part of the culture, the employees really feel it and believe it, right? They need to believe it. And then they're talking about it. And then all the people outside the company see it and they believe it too. It can be, it can be pretty powerful. There's a lot of uh, what I think aren't 100% accurate um, belief about stereotypes about the work ethic of the millennial generation that they're lazy. They don't want to move out of mom and dad's house. They expect to be paid for doing absolutely nothing. Um, I've had some really good interns come through here at Neon Goldfish that uh, fall in that category. And, uh, they have a, a couple that are on staff or that uh, weren't interns that were on staff that were fantastic employees. And uh, you have this, this, this struggle with a lot of employers that are from the uh, roll up your sleeves and dig a ditch days where it, uh, you know, hard work was all that was. And they, they, I just think there's a disconnection here. And I'd love to hear your insights on, on this, on millennials and are they hireable? Are they hardworking? Are they just the overall, um, the, do they live up to the stereotype that uh, is, is so widely spread? So I am not a millennial. So I'm going to just throw that out there. I am a member of the awesome Gen X generation. We are cynical and boy, are we watched our parents, you know, work hard and, and we're going to work hard. There's they are stereotypes. What we've done at Dell is, um, our CHRO who's very progressive, who was an amazing leader said, I'm getting sick of hearing about how millennials are so difficult. Cause I don't believe that. Um, cause he's got a couple of, of, uh, kids that are now, um, you know, graduating from college and they're sort of Gen Z millennial, um, age. And, and he said, I don't believe that, but how can we myth bust this? So we actually surveyed employees at our company that kind of fit into a certain demographic. And we learned a lot from them. One in particular that's interesting is they don't necessarily want to work from home all the time. Work from home or flexible work is actually valued more by people with children who are more Gen X baby boomer, right? So we're able to kind of figure that out. We're like, okay, because we have a work from home program at Dell and we wanted to know who appreciates it and who wants to use it. And Gen X said, hey, work from home on Friday, like that's cool, but I, I want interaction with people. We were like, oh, wow, cool. The other thing that they told us is they want to be challenged. And this is the really important piece. If you're not getting what you want from someone, millennial or otherwise, maybe you need to take a look in the mirror and think about what conversations you are having with them, how you're challenging them. And a lot of that also has to do with trust. So we had a conversation with our account team from Great Place to Work. You guys may be familiar with that. They do more than just awards. They do a lot of really in-depth analysis around how your employees are feeling. So they do sentiment analysis and trust is a big part of the survey and the sentiment analysis that they do. Trust in your manager and feeling like your manager has trust in you to innovate, to think creatively, to think outside the box. If millennials don't have that, they will leave. And it's not because 
they're looking for greener pastures or they're necessarily even looking for more money. They're looking for the trust, the, the challenge and the ability to be creative in what they do. Now, not everybody is an engineer and, and has patents and can create things every day, but everybody in their job, regardless of what you do, has the ability to think about how they could do their job better. So if someone feels like they have the, the trust from their manager, and I had a conversation with someone on my team yesterday where she was telling me something and I said, so I'm hearing you feel like I trust you to try to do something different today with how we've been doing this in the past. And she said, yes. And I was like, yes, score, goal. Those are the people that you keep and retain. And it's kind of also regardless of millennial versus Gen X. Everybody wants to feel valued, right? Everybody wants to feel like they have opportunity to continue to be challenged and to grow and learn. But millennials in particular, what they've done is they've vocalized this better. So actually good on them and kudos to them because Gen X and baby boomers are just working and working and working and complaining my boss sucks. And what millennials have said, hey, if you're not challenging me and you're not giving me purpose as to why I'm here, then I'm just going to leave. And I'm not mad at you. I'm just going to go somewhere else and I'm going to look for that. So that to me is the big resounding message. And I would agree, Ken, 100 percent. They've gotten a really unfair shake. And I've had I have a couple of people that report to me that I would say are probably millennial. And I've had HR rotation people. We have a wonderful program at Dell. And the HR rotation people are fresh out of grad school and they're amazing. And you just need to give them a little more than fetching coffee, right? And they will give you incredible results. And if they don't course correct, give them feedback, they learn and then and then and then they move forward. So I do think some of the stereotypes also this about being promoted constantly. Have a conversation with them around you don't have to be a manager to be a leader. You don't have to get promoted to get smarter and do things better in your current role. So how can we take these three or four things that you do and expand on it and continue to challenge you and, and use your mind? Like that's, that's not a bad request, right? And so again, I think that it's really on us as you know, business owners or managers or leaders to get the most out of the generation and, it's, and not blame it on them. I think that's been pretty unfair. Thank you for that answer. That uh, was a lot of insight there. And it sounds more like a lack of evolution on the business mm-hmm. owner manager side to kind of correlate with. And you look at this in, in from a recruitment marketing or a, a, a management of uh, current employees uh, approach in, in the evolution of marketing in itself and how we uh, cater to the changing consumer. There's a lot of, uh, if we continue to advertise our, uh, products and services strictly on television and newspaper and ignore, ignored the internet as a, as a channel and didn't follow the consumer path mm-hmm. in that way, um, we'd be left in the stone ages. And it, I, I love the, the, track that you talked there about that that brings up for so many light bulbs and really um what is your what is your take on on their what's most important to um maybe this younger crowd this uh is is it because i think about when i when i got out of college um you know it was hey where can i go that i'm gonna have some security but i can make the most money and i can deal with a lot of bs and uh, you know but money was my priority i wanted to make I want to make the money. I want to make the cash. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Um, but I'll make that money in, if you empower me, great, but that wasn't one of the top priorities. Do you see any differences? Is, is that empowerment? Is that the, that leadership, that purpose, um, higher on their priority list than maybe some other people with the younger generation, there is, um, a little bit of a difference. We are more alike than we are different. And of course, if you're looking at a baby boomer, they're going to be thinking about pensions and retirement because they're getting ready to retire. So it's sort of a natural thing that depending on the point in time in your life that you're in, what responsibilities you have. Do you have children? I do not. I have three children. They're all getting ready to go to college within a five-year period that the needs and desires of an employee are going to naturally change as a result of that. But for the younger generation, what they're saying is, you know, let's not make no mistake here. I want to be paid fairly. 
And I think they're very savvy around market conditions and being paid fairly. So you pay me fairly, but in return, I will give you um, the best that I can if you challenge me. But I also want to feel like there's kind of a purpose to what I'm doing. So one of the conversations we're having at Dell is talking about how we're um, helping to enable human progress through the digital and, and technical transformation that's going on around the world. And when you start to think about it, this is more than hardware and PCs. This is a big deal. The whole world is changing. And what's interesting that we talked about earlier is recruiting landscape is changing and social media is here, but leadership and how we lead people hasn't changed. We're still treating people the same way, even though we're in a digital age, right? And so really being a part of that transformation, now that Dell and EMC have come together and we have this, this family of brand under Dell Technologies, we, we have a much easier time about talking about our greater purpose, but doing it in a consistent way that gets everybody within the organization. All employees need to be engaged, not just the executives, not just the managers. All employees need to be engaged and having that purpose. So a good example at Dell, and a lot of companies have cool things like this, right, is we are actually recycling waste from um, waterways in the ocean. Sadly, we all know there's a lot of junk that we people have put in water and we're using them as part of our process in some of our equipment and systems. So I think about 10% of our, some of our laptops have, um, you know, the, the recycled plastic. When you talk about things like that, employees get really excited. That's not the only reason why they're at Dell, right? They want to be paid fairly. They want to have interesting, challenging work. They want their manager to trust them. And they want their manager to deliver on their promises and, and for, their, um, for them to trust their managers. But they also like to hear about, oh, this is really cool. We actually have a bigger purpose in the planet and the world. And so that's, and again, I don't think it doesn't matter to Gen X or baby boomers. When you talk to Gen X or baby boomers about it, they're like, wow, that's really cool. What millennials have done has brought a voice to some of this. And again, that's why I think we should praise and value them. Because they're bringing these things up and saying, I don't want to just work at a company and just, you know, check in, stamp in and stamp out and not feel like I have any meaning. And so having meaning is important and you can have meaning and work in finance and marketing and in a corporate um, role and be kind of more behind the scenes. Absolutely can. And so that's where I think it, the conversation is going. And I think there's so many opportunities out there for, and I think corporate America is, is way ahead of the rest of uh, the world. And I'd say that with the, including small and medium sized businesses, um, you guys are definitely way leaps and bounds ahead of the main street as far as getting that culture nailed down and appealing to these items. But it, the opportunity that lies for a small business, you know, we're, we're competing with uh, similar pools. We're, we're competing with, with corporate America as well. The larger, larger organizations, uh, and so as a small business owner, I look at, okay, great. What can I bring to the table? What can I do to attract? How can I make myself different? Obviously, you know, the baseline is going to be pay and benefits and things, but some of these additional mm -hmm. things that you bring up are spectacular in those little, just, you know, everything's usually a couple percentage points, uh, a couple notches, uh, that away from, from being great, good to great. And, you know, what can we do to become great? Um, as a company to attract talent and retain talent. And when you think about corporations, especially those of us that are mature technology companies, because we really struggle with a smaller, more dynamic startup or small to medium technology businesses. They're attracting a ton of talent. Um, so, so we don't necessarily have the upper hand, but um, I think that for the larger, more mature companies, we had to do this. This what I mean, and, and I'm being candid here, right? It's not like we said in 2010, we're going to start focusing on things like employment branding and recruitment marketing because we just feel like it. It's going to make us feel good. We, <laughs> we had, in part of my language, an oh shit moment where we're like, sure. we have to do this. We will not compete. And when you can't compete for talent, you fail as an organization. And that's where other great companies like Microsoft's in a really good job where They've put a lot of investment and a lot of people and a lot of time because it's it was scary for mature technology companies. And sadly, you see people like IBM, they're struggling. I mean, I just read IBM had their 22nd quarter of decline in a row. Remember how sexy and cool IBM was in the 80s? 
So they have no, yeah. they have no choice. If they're going to survive, they have to change some things. And, and even though they're sort of a competitor of Dell's, I'm rooting for them, you know, like um, to see a big company like that, be able to change some things um, at Dell, we went private. And then Michael Dell had this amazing, pl- he's pretty much a genius, had this amazing plan. I want to create end-to-end IT solutions and be a part of the driving force of the digital security and workplace transformation. And he bought EMC and their federated companies. And we have these eight wonderful brands that are a part of this transformation and driving, you know, the dialogue around this. Um, That's how we're staying alive and how we're keeping people excited. If we had been doing what we'd been doing 10 to 15 years ago, we would be in big trouble, big trouble. So that's the thing for big companies. If you rest on your laurels and you just go, oh, we're just so great. We're Johnson & Johnson, which Johnson & Johnson's great. They have a, a fabulous brand. Um, some of the advertising they've been doing with, you know, nurses and, and um, patients and, you know, they have to make it real for people to keep people excited about their brand. It's brilliant. But they're not doing it just because they're like, this feels good, although it does. We're like, we have to do this to continue to be relevant and to attract people we have to touch people's minds but also their hearts or they're just going to walk away there's just too much competition and the market's like really pretty tight right now that's interesting um you might have already answered this in because you've you've talked a lot about the we've talked a lot about change and evolution, but um, looking in that, that maybe is a little bit rear view mirror type stuff up to today. Um, but even looking forward, what has you really excited about the future? What are some of the things maybe you're working on now that you could share with us or some of the things that you see coming down trends um, that has you really excited at the moment or that you are going to be more excited about in the future? I feel like this phrase is sort of abused and used too much, but Recruiting and HR really having a seat at the table and making sure that our business leaders really see the value of things like employment brand and talent capabilities and um, leadership and how important you're not just a, you're not just a manager like you have an opportunity to inspire people and that's actually going to improve our business that excites me so what we've been able to see at Dell as an example and I know other companies that they if they did this, they would see it too. I just know it. So I'm like, go do it, guys. Um, but we've been able to prove that leaders that could get what we call inspiring leader feedback from their team members through our annual anonymous survey, um, they have a significantly higher score of EMPS. And EMPS helps drive things like CMPS and market share and financial results, right? So we're having that kind of dialogue where the EMPS, how the employers are performing, how the leaders are performing, are they inspirational to their team, and how it's actually a part of the health of the company, period. It's not a bunch of numbers, although there are some numbers because there's some really cool data about it, but it, it's those four things that will make us successful. That is exciting to me because I think where some companies are still stuck and quite frankly where we've been in the past is sort of like, Here's what we're telling Wall Street. This is what we're doing next quarter. Meet your quotas, meet your goals. That's where how we measure and drive success. People are not motivated by that, by the way. I, they're just, they're not, unless you're like the CFO. Like maybe that motivates you, right? <laughs> and so we're breaking out for our employees to say it's simple. We want to know what our customer's experience is. And customer net, net promoter score is very valuable. And we use that as a barometer and we talk about it constantly. But then there's the employee net promoter score. And when you have a high employee net promoter score, they refer more talent to the company, they attrit at a lower rate, and they refer more products and services, which, by the way, is a financial gain. And then we have the financial results, and then we have the market share and the market potential that we talk about. It's simple. It's those four things. But the fact that people are now more of the conversation, the power of our employee voice and employee advocacy, the power of our leaders and what they can really do. We've seen a 70 point spread in EMPS between an uninspiring leader and an inspiring leader at Dell. That's shocking, right? So it's like, get the, get the uninspiring leaders either inspirational and get them the help and get them the help they need or get them out. Right. And then the inspirational leaders, 
let's talk to them about what they do and their best practices. And it's sort of like, tell me, share with me and celebrate them and praise them because they're actually bringing more value to the company. It's not the day-to-day grind of being a manager. And that conversation, which our CHRO is leading, and he does an amazing job talking to our most senior level people, Michael Dell and his direct reports, um, that conversation is really important to people like me. That's what excites me. And then people start to see value in things like, oh, recruiting, right? Because what's happened in the past is like, ugh, recruiting, go fill my rack. Stop asking me questions. Oh, you need feedback. Uh, it's like, this is actually candidate experience is valuable because there's return on investment with how you treat people and whether they're going to buy your products and services and refer other people to your company to work there, right? So that's the exciting thing. That's what gets me really going. It's not things like AI, (laughs) right? You might have thought I might have said AI. Um, AI is here. AI is going to grow. AI is not going to take all of our jobs, but it's going to complement our jobs. And I do think it's quite interesting, but it doesn't excite me the way that what I was just describing excites me. I'm glad you didn't say AI to speak of. <laughs> yes. AI is okay, right? But let's Everyone be says honest. AI. Let's be honest. When you call American Express and you have a question about your card, what do you do? You press you start pressing zero immediately. Zero. Zero, zero. zero. And then zero, zero. <laughs> it's funny, right, agent, right, right. agent, <laughs> customer service, agent. You know, I mean, you know, nobody really wants to talk to a computer. Um, I do think there's amazing technology that's having this, you know, this machine learning and this self-learning and AI can do some things. Um, But there's some things that I I personally don't just don't think they'll ever really be able to do. But I think you can complement processes and operationalize things um, and make improvements with AI. I do believe that. But I'm I'm not I'm not excited about it. I'm excited about where our conversation is going at the company I've worked at for 14 years and how we're so much more focused on the people and the part that our talent plays in our success than I am about where are we going to plug and play AI. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Yay. I love it too. (laughs) Jaffer, if you have one piece of parting advice for our listening audience, what would that be? I'm going to be a broken record, but my piece of advice is do not do it alone. And do not underestimate the power of your employees in the marketplace. What stories do your employees have to share about what what excites them about working at Neon Goldfish, right? And share that. When you're recruiting somebody, say, hey, I'm the hiring manager. And you're, you know, so I'm Justin and you're going to be meeting with Ken. But actually, Susie's this other person on our team. And I just want to share some stuff that she has around some of the things she's done with the company that excites her. And you can never do too much of that. Um, so I think that's really powerful as you get bigger as an organization, start doing it on a functional basis. Cause people really do want to know what is it like to be marketing? What is it, what is it like to be sales? And that's what we're doing a lot more of in the coming year at Dell is really talking about what career can you have as a salesperson and not so much about the culture, although we still talk about the culture, but we've just done a lot of culture talk. So, um, don't underestimate and don't do it. Don't do it yourself. If you're a small business owner and you've got 12 people reporting to you, don't try to do all the recruiting and the talent stuff yourself. That's crazy talk. Engage with each person on your team and give them maybe one big initiative that they can go run and drive with. And they're going to be that voice for the company. It's going to be that much more powerful. I love that. Absolutely love that. Awesome. What is the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you? You can follow me and direct message me on Twitter. So I think I have to follow you back in order for you to direct message me or you can direct message me and I can choose to respond. Um, But I'm also, I'm on LinkedIn. So I'm on social. I'm pretty, pretty engaged. And I usually respond to direct messages on Twitter pretty quickly. So that would be, yeah. And I'm Jennifer N at Dell, at Jennifer N at sign at Dell. Beautiful. We will have that information available in the show notes at neongoldfish.com forward slash podcast. Jennifer, thank you so much for being on today. Lots and lots of value for our listening audience. You're welcome. It was fun. Yeah, we had a blast. Okay, until next time, this is Justin, Ken, and Jennifer signing off. Neon Noise Nation, we will see you again next week. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Neon Noise Podcast. Did you enjoy the podcast? If so, please subscribe, share with a friend, or write a review. We want to cover the topics you want to hear. If you have an idea for a topic you'd like Justin and Ken to cover, connect with us on Twitter at Neon Goldfish or through our website at neongoldfish.com.